It started with the phone calls. Sheila would pick up and hear nothing but heavy breathing on the other end. Hello? Who is this? She'd ask right before the caller hung up. The calls started happening once, then twice a week. Sheila changed her number, but it didn't stop. The notes came next. Sheila would find plain white envelopes stuck in her front door when she came home at night. Inside were notes made from newspaper clippings that read things like I'm watching you, and you belong to me. Sheila installed a security system, but the notes kept coming. One night, the power went out in Sheila's apartment. As she lit candles, she felt a cold draft hit her neck. She whipped around but saw nothing besides the open window. Trembling, she closed and locked it. The next day, Sheila noticed a dark car parked across from her building. The windows were tinted so she couldn't see the driver, but they didn't move for hours. Just sat there watching her apartment. That's when Sheila went to the police. They opened a case but said there wasn't much they could do without evidence of a crime. They suggested she keep a record of this suspicious activity. The following Tuesday, Sheila came home to find her apartment trashed. Picture frames smashed, furniture overturned, belongings strewn everywhere. She realized the stalker had been inside and called the police. Again, they took a report, but with no signs of forced entry, there was little they could do. Sheila bought pepper spray and a baseball bat. She stopped going out alone at night, but she still felt like unseen eyes followed her every move, watched her as she slept. Sheila's fear slowly turned to paranoia. On Thursday, Sheila's phone rang, but just like before, only heavy breathing answered. Something in Sheila snapped. Leave me alone. She screamed into the phone. I'll call the police. I'll, I'll kill you myself if I have to. The heavy breathing quickened. Sheila hung up, shaking. That weekend, Sheila's friends Amy and Brian convinced her to join them at a crowded restaurant downtown. Sheila had become a shut-in, but she reluctantly agreed, not wanting to be alone. As they ate dinner, Sheila thought she spotted the dark car parked across the street, but when she looked again, it was gone. I think my stalker followed me here, Sheila told Amy and Brian. They became concerned but said she seemed paranoid. Sheila scanned the restaurant yet saw no one suspicious. Finally, she started to relax and enjoy herself. Mike's on the drive home. Sheila noticed a pair of headlights following close behind her. Each turn she made, the car made two. Panic flooded Sheila's body. She sped up, but the car kept pace, its brights blinking rapidly. Sheila raced into her parking garage, the stalker close behind. She screeched up each level until she reached her floor. The other car was gone. Breathing hard, Sheila got out and headed for her apartment. She fumbled to unlock her door in the dark garage. Keys slipped from her hands, clattering to the ground. As Sheila bent to pick them up, she heard footsteps echoing behind her. She turned just in time to see a dark figure raise a bat high in the air. Sheila screamed and blocked her face. The bat came crashing down. Sheila's arms erupted in pain. She sank to her knees and peered up through blurry eyes. Brian stood above her wildly grinning. In his other hand glinted a knife. Me, Brian? Sheila sputtered in disbelief. You shouldn't have made me jealous, Sheila, Brian said. Dancing with that guy, laughing with your friends. You're meant to be mine. Brian's face contorted in rage. He raised the bat again, but Sheila kicked him hard in the knee and scrambled away. Brian cursed loudly. Sheila ran, banging on doors, yelling for help. Brian's footsteps pounded after her. 
Sheila burst through the stairwell door just as Brian tackled her. They tumbled down the concrete stairs in a painful heap. Sheila's ankle twisted beneath her. Brian recovered first. He dragged Sheila down the stairs into the lower garage. Somebody help me, Sheila cried feebly, but the garage was deserted. Brian hauled her to a dark fan and handcuffed her wrists behind her back. Duct tape sealed Sheila's mouth shut. We'll be happy together, just the two of us. No one will keep us apart. Brian rasped in Sheila's ear. Sheila screamed against the tape and thrashed around, but Brian shoved her roughly into the back of the van. The doors slammed shut. Sheila sobbed as the van accelerated out of the garage. Her whole body ached. She could feel warm blood trickling down her hands from the handcuffs digging into her skin. After what felt like hours, the van slowed to a stop. Brian yanked open the back doors and pulled Sheila out into a windowless concrete room. It appeared to be some kind of basement or cellar. Brian slammed the doors shut, leaving them in total darkness. Sheila heard him fumbling for something. A second later, a bare light bulb flickered on overhead. Brian had a gun trained on Sheila. Don't try anything funny or you're dead. Understand? Sheila nodded, tears streaming down her face. Brian cut the duct tape from her mouth, but left the handcuffs. The cold metal cut into Sheila's wrist. Why are you doing this? Sheila choked out. I thought we were friends. Brian pressed the gun against Sheila's chest. Friends? I want you to be my girlfriend. I've loved you for so long, but you never noticed me. Sheila's mind raced. She had to keep Brian talking, distract him somehow. You're right, Brian. I should have noticed you. How can I make it up to you? Brian narrowed his eyes suspiciously. Make it up to me. Like how? Well, we need food. Water. I want to cook you a nice meal, Sheila said. Brian thought for a moment before nodding slowly. I am pretty hungry. There's a small kitchen through that door. I'll uncuff you so you can cook, but no funny business. Sheila nodded eagerly. Brian unlocked the handcuffs. As he led Sheila to the kitchen, she spotted a rickety wooden staircase in the corner. If she could get up there while Brian was distracted, maybe she could escape. The kitchen was dirty and cramped, but had a stove, sink, and basic utensils. Brian sat at a small table, his gun aimed at Sheila as she opened cabinets and the refrigerator. I'm going to make spaghetti. Is that all right? Sheila asked. Brian nodded. Sheila's hands shook as she filled a pot with water. She had to time this perfectly for it to work. But when the water started boiling, Sheila dropped in the noodles. Her heart pounded as she tried acting normal, chatting lightly with Brian about his job while she cooked. After 10 agonizing minutes, Sheila announced the spaghetti was ready. As Brian set down the gun to eat, Sheila seized her chance. She threw the boiling pot of water in Brian's face and lunged for the stairs. Sheila raced up the steps. Brian screaming in agony behind her. At the top was a door. Sheila turned the handle, but it was locked. She could hear Brian recovering. Sheila threw her shoulder against the door desperately until it splintered open. She stumbled out into a decrepit house. Sheila didn't know where she was, but she ran for the front door anyway. Just as she pulled it open, Brian dragged her back by the hair. They struggled wildly until Brian pinned Sheila down and wrapped his hands around her throat. Sheila choked and gasped for air. Spots swam before her eyes. She clawed at Brian's arms, but he was too strong. That right as her vision started going dark, Sheila heard police sirens. Brian's grip loosened in surprise. 
He whipped around to see red and blue lights flashing through the windows. No, it can't end like this, Brian cried. The voice on a megaphone commanded Brian to come out with his hands up. Sheila almost collapsed in relief. With Brian distracted, she smashed a vase over his head. He crumpled to the ground, and the police stormed in and cuffed Brian. Sheila just sobbed with gratitude, the stalking, the fear, the paranoia. It was finally over. Thanks to quick thinking and bravery, Sheila had survived her worst nightmare, but she knew she would never feel completely safe again.